think, thank you, Mike, and thank you all for, for coming today. Uh, just to, uh, I'm going to deal with the, the two topics. Uh, the, the, probably the bulk of it will be on the, the hard case, the, the high-risk pregnancy cardiac uh, cases. And then I'll say a little bit about the, Dr. Riley and myself's role in abortion pill reversal service in, in the United Kingdom. Just a, a conflict of interest. I'm a, a Catholic who believes in the teachings of the Catholic Church, but also believe that the teachings are consistent with providing very good health care to the general population. I'm going to start with a, I, I can say, well, it's a sad story, but it's a, it's a true story, and I think there's lessons to be learned from it. A 33-year-old lady had a cardiac arrest in the community. Uh, she'd been previously very well, uh, wasn't known to have any cardiac problems. Uh, it was a witness arrest, and CPR was commenced, qu uh, commenced quite quickly by an off-duty policeman. Uh, an AED, a defibrillator, was brought to the scene. Uh, she had a prolonged period of resuscitation, and eventually uh, they got her back into normal sinus rhythm with restoration of a spontaneous circulation and, and breathing, and she was transferred to hospital. I think the downtime for the cardiac arrest was between 10 and 12 minutes. Uh, she was initially... Um, Neurologically, it was uncertain what the outcome was going to be. She was transferred to the intensive care, spent four or five days there, but made a, a, quite a good recovery. Turned out she was pregnant. She was pregnant at around the 13-week stage, just uh, starting the second trimester. She had one previous child who was about six years old, and there was no, no known problems during that, that pregnancy. Um, while, during she, while she was in the intensive care, she had an echocardiograph performed, and it showed that she had a severely dilated left ventricle with severe heart failure, the ejection fraction 30%, which is in the severe range of impairment. It wasn't known at this stage, did she have a pre-existing cardiac condition that led to the cardiac arrest, or had she suffered a cardiac arrest for some other unknown cause, and then because of the prolonged resuscitation, the damage that that might have caused the, the, the severe heart failure, although the, the, the former seemed to be more likely, even though she wasn't, she wasn't previously known to have any cardiac problems. Uh, eventually, after a few days, she was transferred back to the cardiac ward and had made a quite good recovery at this stage. There was initial disorientation, but that improved within a few days. She had a normal brain scan. Uh, she had a, a scan done on the lungs to make sure there was no pulmonary embolus that could have caused it, this event, and that was clear. Um, her lung function was good. An ultrasound confirmed that her, uh, her baby was fine. Uh, 13, it was coming at 14 weeks at this stage, a strong heartbeat, and there was no signs of any damage to the baby despite the the downtime and the, with the cardiac arrest. So clinically she was quite stable. We put her on a beta blocker, uh, which immediately improved her prognosis, um, both for reducing the likelihood of further cardiac rhythm problems, but also because of the heart failure, improving her prognosis with early beta blocker introduction. And when I was a medical student, beta blockers were, we were told they can't be used in, in pregnancy, they can't be used in heart failure. Uh, but we know that that's not the case, that they're generally safe, particularly the cardioselective ones. Uh, certainly to the standard treatment now for heart failure and uh, can be used safely in, in pregnancy too. We didn't introduce a nascent inhibitor because that is known to have teratogenic effects at certain stages of pregnancy. She did have some other treatments for suspected chest infection and folic acid because of her pregnancy. <clears throat> uh, so she remained very stable. I, we kept her on the cardiac ward. We had hoped that she would make a good recovery because some of these patients when they have a cardiac arrest, especially if, if we don't know what the underlying etiology is, once you start them on treatment and they become stable and their heart rhythm stays stable, some of them make a very rapid and good recovery. But unfortunately, about seven day, or ten days after she had the initial scan, the echo was repeated and it showed no, no improvement, unfortunately. She was still severe heart failure with a dilated left ventricle. So we knew at that stage she was going to need to have a, a, a defibrillator, an implantable cardiac defibrillator inserted. We don't do them in our hospital, so we had to make arrangements for transfer to the tertiary referral hospital uh, close by. And we discussed future treatments, we discussed about her baby, we discussed that the, the, there was a risk during the pregnancy, with continuing pregnancy, with heart failure, but that we could get through that with close monitoring, regular cardiac echo follow-up, uh, regular heart failure follow-up, and we would get her to a safe stage of pregnancy and get her to deliver, deliver her child safely. So in, in good faith, she was transferred to the other centre with a view towards having a uh, sorry, uh, an ICD inserted. Uh, I, I thought the next I would hear would be maybe a week later or two weeks later when she'd be released from the other centre and that she'd be referred back to our heart failure clinic. But I was very disappointed uh, when I got a letter a couple of weeks later to say that once she got over there the following day, she was seen by an obstetrician who advised that she shouldn't continue with the pregnancy, that the risk was too high, even though she was very stable at this stage. 
and there'd be no signs of any deterioration in the, in the several weeks that she'd been in, in the, the, the primary institution. Uh, so they had an abortion performed so at, just before it, between 17 and 18 weeks after transfer. The following day she had a cardiac MRI which showed that she had indeed a, a dilated myocarditis type picture that she had some unknown previous cardiac problem that had led to the cardiac arrest. She got her implants done the day after her cardiac MRI and was discharged home shortly after that with, with follow up through the heart failure clinic. She was offered some bereavement counselling and we, we haven't heard any, any news since then. So I want to talk a little bit about high risk pregnancy in, in relation to that type of case and some other even other cases which are considered to be even higher risk uh, than this uh, unfortunate uh, situation. The good news is that most women who have cardiac problems in pregnancy have a very good outcome. There is little or no real danger to the mother or to the child in the vast majority, whether that's ischemic heart disease, rhythm problems, valve problems, uh, most forms of cardiomyopathy. However, there are some cardiac conditions where there is a recognized increased risk. Uh, sometimes these risks are calculated on the basis of historical information, anecdotes, uh, small studies, and I'll be, I'll be saying a little bit about that. The ones in particular that, uh, that draw our attention are the, the, the bottom of the pre-existing severe heart failure, which uh, our young lady had, and the uh, severe pulmonary hypertension. That's considered probably the one with the highest risk. Eisenmenger syndrome is a condition that's, which leads on to pulmonary hypertension. It's a condition of usually congenital heart disease that has either gone unnoticed or untreated, where the, there's a shunt flow from the left side of the heart into the right side of the heart over a period of time, and eventually the right-sided pressures rise so high that they actually exceed the left-sided pressures, and then you've gone, you've gone beyond the point of um, being able to fix the problem once it gets to that stage, and that leads to pulmonary hypertension. So that's one of the, the, the major uh, causes of pulmonary hypertension, although not, not very, very common nowadays. To understand a little bit about this, we've got to appreciate at least the, some of the changes that take place uh, on the cardiovascular system during pregnancy. So there is, you know, and any woman who's been pregnant here will, will appreciate this far more than I would, but it's an increase in the circulating blood volume, understandably. There's an increase in the stroke volume, uh, and there's an increase in the heart rate. And even by the end of the first trimester, so by 12 weeks or so, there's, a, there's quite a significant increase in the, in the cardiac output and the blood volume, even by that stage reaches a peak effect uh, later on at, at the end of the second, starting the third trimester. Uh, so on the left side of the graph you've got the increasing stroke volume, the increasing cardiac output, the increasing heart rate, showing the, what the potentially could be you know, increasing pressure on the heart. But this is counteracted with, with reducing resistance and increasing elasticity in the, the major blood vessels. So there is a balance, a reflex balance, hormonal changes that lead to protective mechanisms for the mother and for the child. Changes occur then during labour, so that's another sort of potentially danger time for the, in, in some of these cardiac conditions. So during labour and during delivery, there's increased catecholamines, adrenaline, and increased um, pain, again, does, doesn't help anxiety. And in the peripartum period, there is a, a quite a significant increase, and that's a number of physiological events happen to, to cause that. Uh, with the, re the release or the delivery of the baby of less compression of the inferior vena cava to get an increased venous return to the right side of the heart and uh, that's in going to increase the, the, the circulatory pressure on the heart uh, which, which can in, in some rare situations lead to significant pulmonary congestion um, also the, again this is well, bleeding generally is not a good thing maybe it has some protective effect in, in delivery in that there is a, some degree of, of blood loss uh, during normal vaginal deliveries and even more so during caesarean section operative deliveries. Um, again, I mentioned about the re reduction in the, 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 IV, the, IV, the IVC, release of the IVC compression causing increased venous return to the right side of the heart. And then delivery of the placenta, because the placenta is a massive store for, for blood cells. That volume goes back into the, into the maternal circulation. So there is that. And again, in the normal heart, the normal mother situation, that, that's not a problem. But someone who has a compromised heart, that can be of major significance. And you've also lost the benefit of that uh, re reduction, reduced re resistance that the placenta has been uh, providing. In addition, some of the medications that might be given during labour and during the de delivery period uh, might in turn lead to hypotension, low blood pressure, faster heart rates. If you read any, any medical textbook, that's been, certainly that's been written you know, in, in the last 
40, 50 years and up to recent times. Uh, when it comes to high-risk pregnancy, and it talks about these conditions, Eisenmenger syndrome, uh, heart failure, pre-existing heart failure, um, pulmonary hypertension, they will all give phrases like this. This is a sort of a typical one that I took from one. These patients should receive preconception counselling and then offered termination. Uh, this is a, a standard one that's often quoted. In fact, when I made my feelings known to the, to the hospital that, uh, that dealt with my, with my young lady, uh, I was told to, to, to read this uh, article on heart disease and pregnancy, that termination of pregnancy should always be offered to, to, the, to patients uh, with severe cardiac or con uh, what are perceived to be severe cardiac problems. Uh, the, another one from 2006, um, specifically to, to dealing with dilated cardiomyopathy, termination should be offered. So again and again you'll see that these um, recommendations, but what we need to ask is what is the evidence for this? And I said at the start, a, a lot of this is based on studies, small studies, anecdotal cases, uh, often going back to the 1940s, 1950s, before conventional modern heart failure treatments were available and uh, before a lot of these physiological changes were, were recognised. That, that, that was only one, one real option. So the question that we have to address is, are there alternatives to, to abortion? And are physicians and patients prepared to consider these alternatives? So speaking as a Catholic, uh, you know, I don't need to go through, Mike dealt with this beautifully earlier on this morning, that we're all created in the image and person of God, or the, Im the image and likeness of God, or the, or the person of God. Um, the human life begins at conception, begins at fertilization. We, there's no scientific doubt whatsoever about that. And that all human lives have equal inherent value. And that nobody is, nobody is considered inferior to another one. There's the, the German, even before the Nazis, but adopted by the Nazis, the, the, the philosophy of Lebens unwertes Leben. It sounds worse in German than in English. It's a lives unworthy of life. Uh, so that's certainly not consistent with Catholic teaching, but unfortunately it is very much the that the philosophy of, of many in the uh, utilitarian world that we live in. There are, however, we do recognise that there are some situations uh, where there is a conflict and there's, there are difficult situations for the mother where there is a genuine threat to life. Um, but even in these situations, we still have to try and make every effort to try and save the mother and the child, if possible, recognising that in rare cases that may not be possible, such as the severe chorioamnionitis, uh, pre-viability where there is little or no chance that the, that the baby is going to survive. Possibly the, the cancer of the womb or hysterectomy is, you know, at least should be offered uh, rather than let the, the cancer develop, uh, putting the mother's life at risk. Fortunately, mo most of the serious cardiac problems and most of the other serious maternal problems related to continued pregnancy occur well into the third trimester, or at least well into the late second, third trimester. So. By that stage, in most cases where there is a, a genuine threat to the mother's life, the baby can be delivered um, after the stage of viability. Again, just mention very briefly that you know, abortion, the, the, the directly intended termination of pregnancy, uh, so where the, the target is the, the baby itself, is not permitted uh, under any circumstances in, in Catholic uh, moral teaching. Some of you may be aware of the Dublin Declaration. This is... This is um, Actually, very sad in a way. This, uh, this declaration, which is a wonderful document, it was, came about as a result of a conference of pro-life obstetricians, and not only from Ireland, but from all over the world, um, who met in Dublin on, on this day, and uh, uh, obviously an important feast day of Our Lady, on the 8th of September 2012. And they made a statement that uh, there are no medical situations where you know, d deliberate termination of a, of, a, of a life, destruction of a life, is, is necessary. Unfortunately, it was within a few weeks that the Savita Halepan of our case actually uh, broke out shortly after that statement had been, had been made. Going back a little bit, this, um, I, I was very proud of this, um, as an Irish person, of, of this introduction into the Irish Constitution in 1983. This came about actually mainly as a result of negotiations between the Irish equivalent of the Catholic Medical Association and politicians and lawyers who could see the way the wind was blowing and that it wouldn't be long before abortion was going to be introduced into Ireland and that they felt they had to do something about this to protect uh, the unborn life. And as far as I know, this was the first time that uh, any state in the world recognised the, the value of life of the unborn child and put it into the constitution. 
not given it uh, ex um, higher value over the life of the mother, but equal value. So, and the important word actually in that whole statement is acknowledges. The, the, like the state, as was said earlier, doesn't give us, doesn't grant us our value. It acknowledges it though, the value that is inherent and already there. And that lasted until very recently. Uh, we were also the first country to deliberately remove uh, by referendum protection for, for unborn life. Prior to that, while negotiations and pressure was being put on the Irish government to introduce uh, abortion, uh, they had a number of, sort of investigations and inquiries and committees, and this was one statement made by eminent uh, the, the members of the Irish, the Irish equivalent of the College of Obstetricians uh, saying that there are no medical indications for abortion, no, no risk to the mother that can be avoided by abortion, and that there is nothing that would stop, with the law of the land as it was at that time, that would stop uh, any mother receiving whatever necessary treatment if there was a genuine danger to her life. Interesting also, up until the law was changed in Ireland, even the, Irish, the equivalent of the Irish Medical Council was very much supportive of, of the law as it stood, and they, you know, they was consistent, even though it wasn't, it's not a Catholic document, obviously, but consistent with the, with the, with the Catholic ethos, that all lives are of equal value, and that situations in pregnancy where there, there is, um, where there's a risk, then you try to save both lives, if at all possible, but there are, recognising that there are rare situations where that may not be all, always possible. And again, once again, the principle of double effect was used throughout all of these documents, whether it's by, through the Catholic Church, through the Irish Medical Council, and through the, uh, the legislation in Ireland at, at, at that time. Interestingly, so, and this is, the, this, this is the reason why Ireland had to be targeted, because it was a thorn in the side of the, of the pro-abortion lobby throughout the world. That Ireland was consistently, again and again, year after year, in the, among the top countries with the safest maternal uh, records. There was a very, very low maternal mortality rate. That's why the Savita Halepan of her case was so sensational. It was so rare that that sort of thing never, never happened in, in Ireland. It was very, very rare. So the, the maternal rate in Ireland, 8 per 100,000 live births in 2005, whereas the UK was, uh, oh, sorry, the, uh, Ireland was one compared to the UK of eight, uh, despite the, uh, the, the, the very liberal abortion laws in the, in, the, in the UK. And the USA, right through the Roe v. Wade period, had a, much, much higher maternal mortality rates compared to Ireland. Nowadays, with Malta and Poland, they're in the top 10, and they're the two of the few developed countries that still have either complete or very uh, significant restrictions on, on abortions. So, getting back to the high-risk conditions, eyes and Menger's pulmonary hypertension. Uh, so traditionally, the, if you read the textbooks, they'll say there's a mortality rate for the mother uh, if pregnancy is allowed to progress in these patients of 25 to up to 50 percent, which w it would be very unacceptable. However, this is a landmark paper because most of those studies I mentioned earlier, the, 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 uh, the statements that were made as a result of whatever papers had been produced were anecdotal cases. Some of them were being favourable, some of we, we managed to save a woman or we didn't save a woman on and, uh, and small studies. But this was the first time consecutive cases with, with this you know, dangerous condition was actually uh, published in any of the major journals. And published actually in the British Journal of Obstetricians, Gynecologists. It was an observational study and these were women who had pre-existing pulmonary hypertension and became pregnant. And in most cases, they would have been advised straight away just to, you know, to have a termination. And, and most of them would have gone, gone ahead with that. But these were women who courageously decided, no, I want to keep my baby. And they were referred to Sheffield, the Royal Hallam Hospital in Sheffield, which is probably the country's leading centre for the management of pulmonary hypertension, not only in pregnancy, but pulmonary hypertension in general. And these were, there was a retrospective study, nine women with 10 pregnancies. One woman actually got pregnant twice uh, during the, the, the follow-up period. Now, as you can see, it's a nine-year or eight or nine-year follow-up and only you know, 10 cases. So th this is not a very common condition and very few of the women who ha have the condition uh, with pregnancy will, will elect to keep their baby. So it's a very small study, but it was consecutive. It was, uh, we weren't just picking and choosing the ones that we wanted to show that we didn't want to show. And uh, all of the, they were all treated with um, in a way, they were lucky in the sense that new treatments had become available in the early 2000s or the late 90s, 2000s, that allowed an, an improved prognosis for everybody, not just women in pregnancy, but everybody with pulmonary hypertension, improved prognosis, improved symptom control. And they, by the application of these new, relatively new 
targeted treatments, they were able to um, at least offer these women a realistic chance of, of survival and also saving their babies. All of the babies survived. All of the women survived the initial period. One woman who did become unwell four weeks after delivery decided she, she didn't want to go to hospital. She, uh, she, she delivered her baby. She, her time was up and she didn't. She stopped her treatment and then she sadly passed away. Uh, all of the babies were healthy. So it was the first time to show that there wasn't a, you know, it wasn't inevitable that women were going to die or that the babies were going to die. However, the authors did, did uh, end with a note of um, warning that, you know, just because we've got, you know, quite good data in this situation, that, that doesn't mean that this is a safe condition. So there is still a, an obvious risk and, you know, but with good targeted, tailored, intensive, careful monitoring approach, it is possible in many, if not all, cases to, 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 to save lives. I'm going to introduce you now to um, a remarkable woman called Diane Zwicky, who was a, initially was a nurse and then became a doctor and then became interested in respiratory medicine, then became interested in pulmonary hypertension, and then became interested in pulmonary hypertension and pregnancy. She's probably the world's leading expert in the management of pulmonary hypertension and pregnancy. And uh, the, the, as the title there says, uh, this is a, a local newspaper that was you know, telling the story of this young woman, Stacey Hang, who turned to Dr. Zwicky when she was told, oh, you've got pulmonary hypertension, you're pregnant, you can't keep the baby, you have to have a termination. But she was determined to keep her baby, so it says she risked her life to give birth, uh, and she met the right doctor. So sometimes meeting the right doctor is the best you can do. This is uh, Diane Zwicky, she's, a, she's a, bit, a larger lady, but she's a very, very nice, I had a privilege to meet her at a conference in Europe a few years ago, uh, where she presented her, her, her findings. At that time, I think she had 120 cases, 125 cases. But more recently, in 20, 2018, so just before COVID, uh, she presented her, her up-to-date results at a, a high-risk pregnancy uh, meeting in uh, Italy. And uh, she gave the story of her 16 years experience up to 2018, up to that time, 170 cases of pulmonary hypertension in pregnancy, 170 women survived, delivering 186 babies. Obviously more, either there were some twin pregnancies that she didn't mention, or some of them had more than one pregnancy, probably more than, more than one. One baby did die, one, not on her advice, but on the advice of another physician, uh, the mother opted to, to have a termination at 22 weeks even though she, she was you know, relatively stable at that time. But there was no infant or maternal death. And that's remarkable if you consider that the, the textbooks earlier are quoting a 50% or potentially 50% mortality rate with, with this condition during pregnancy. Uh, we don't need to, to know, but uh, just to emphasize again, just like the, the, the Kylie study from Sheffield, she used very specific targeted treatment uh, individually uh, decided on, on each individual case. Most of them needed uh, intravenous prostacyclin, which is a vasodilator. Uh, it was a very intensive, multi multidisciplinary team management. Um, they, had, they had to get the timing of you know, how often to monitor the patients, uh, how often they needed cardiac echo examinations, and most importantly of all, when, when delivery should be allowed to take place. In the Sheffield study, probably because of staffing issues under the British system, uh, most of the babies were delivered by caesarean section. But Diane Zwicky insists that her baby should be delivered, if possible, in the natural vaginal delivery. And the, the, the way they have staffing allows them to, to do that. They've, all the team can be gathered together very quickly when, when these women come in. And I've, I've emphasized that, that counting every milliliter, so fluid management is vital and key in the to, to achieve a good outcome in, in these cases. So everything that goes into the mother, everything that comes out, you've got to account for it because you're, you're going to look for a negative balance. So when the, the baby is delivered and the, the, the real danger time, first of all, it's recognising when there are danger times and the particular danger time is delivery and for a few weeks afterwards. So particularly for those first 72 hours, that's when in the past uh, women would have died in these situations, having gone through the pregnancy, delivered the baby, and then seemingly okay, and then one or two or three days later suddenly de developing severe, uncontrollable, refractory right heart failure and death. So that's, it's key that women are offloaded as quickly as possible and as safely as possible in, the, in these situations. So they're not just sent home the same day, they're kept in for at least three or four days. Then when they do go home, there's continuing diuretic treatment and they're, they're followed up closely uh, in their clinic. So a lot of this is anticipatory, recognising when 
So that when is the danger likely to happen and what can we do to ameliorate or prevent these dangers or deal with the risks now that we know that, that, that they're going to happen. So bringing us back to, the, to my lady that I present at the start, could the outcome have been favourable? I, I, I think so. I think she was stable. There was no signs that she was developing any increasing risk to her heart. I think we certainly could have got her to 28, 30, 32 weeks uh, with regular cardiac echo follow-up. Um, but you know, the powers that be decided otherwise in, in that case. Uh, I have looked after other women in, in pregnancy uh, with heart failure and um, who, who've, just, who've decided that they, they want to keep their babies and there's been at least four women that, I'm, that I know of, that I'm aware of, who have had su successful pregnancies without any deterioration in their cardiac condition despite having significant pre-existing uh, heart failure and, con and continuing heart failure during their pregnancies. So in conclusion on that issue, pregnancy, there are usually, the good news is there are usually good outcomes for women with cardiac problems uh, in, in pregnancy, that most of the cardiac problems are easy to, or at least relatively easy to manage, with, with good uh, monitoring, uh, keeping a close eye on things, uh, anticipating problems when they arise. There are some conditions, such as those mentioned, that do have increased risks, but abortion is, doesn't necessarily have to be the first uh, line of option in, in any of in any of these cases. And with excellent care, proper uh, teamwork, uh, proper anticipation, uh, it, it can be possible, and, and proper treatment of the conditions as far as it's safe to do so, uh, it should, it's possible to, to save both the lives in the, the vast majority, if not all of these, of these cases. And all of this, this, this approach is consistent with the teaching of the, of the Catholic Church. However, more evidence uh, that there is still a, a scepticism in the scientific world. Diane Zwicky, I showed that her last, uh, she has had lots of papers published on pulmonary hypertension, but there's a reluctance for journals, the high-ranking journals, to publish her work in, in pregnancy. I, I don't know why that might be. So I, I won't dwell quite as long, but I think it's only fair that, so some of you may already be aware of this uh, issue, uh, some may not. I have to thank Dr. Dr. Eileen Riley, who was the first person in this country, I think, to offer abortion pill reversal to women in the United Kingdom. I think I was the second. I was, I was the first, I was the, I'm the first doctor in history banned from saving lives. Dr. Riley is the second. Most of you probably know that abortions can be carried out by a number of different ways. Up until recently, um, there was no such thing as pharmacologically, or, or well, there was actually, the other drugs were used, but it was, uh, there was the minority. The, the majority were suction aspiration uh, by sticking a tube into the, into the, through the cervix and uh, aspirating the, the, the baby and the other contents out. Uh, the, if you read, uh, read BPAS or somebody, maybe even the NHS, they talk about gently inserting a small tube and gently removing the pregnancy. So the euphemisms are rife in, when it comes to uh, abortion description. Dismemberment, so at a certain stage, so 13, 14, 14 15 weeks, uh, second trimester, uh, a baby is not going to fit into a small tube, so they have to, to basically tear it limb from limb and crush the head uh, to get the pieces out. If it's gone beyond, or if it's close to or beyond the stage of viability and they will still want to carry out an abortion, they generally try to kill the baby first, so they inject usually either potassium chloride or digoxin uh, through the maternal abdomen into the under ultrasound guidance, aiming to get into the fetal heart or some, some part of the fetus to try and kill it before they then induce delivery, uh, which can take a few days. In all, in all of these cases, the intention is to end a human life. However, the one that we're going to concentrate on is the pharmacologically induced abortions using a combination of two drugs, mifepristone, uh, which is a progesterone receptor antagonist, and misoprostol, which is a, a prostaglandin. And the numbers of abortions in the England and Wales and Scotland has, has grown, I wouldn't say exponentially, but dramatically in recent years. So it was... More, from 1967, there was small little trickles, a few hundred, a few thousand, tens of thousands, and now we're up into, you know, 230,000. Particularly over the last six, seven years, probably with the, the wider availability of the, of the medical drugs, that, or the, the drugs, the chemicals that, that, that cause the abortions. This is the way that uh, the, the dashed line is surgical abortions. So surgical, the, number, the, the relative numbers of surgical abortions has dramatically gone down, but there still are some performed and the numbers of um, medically induced abortions using mifepristone, misoprostol has tremendously increased uh, over the last, uh, particularly over the last 10 years. Uh, the, the crossover came in 
2014, when for the first, or after 2014, for the first time, more than 50% of abortions were performed by medical means as opposed to surgical. In the United States, interestingly, they're, they're still 50-55%. The reason for that is they're not allowed to use the medical drugs. To, they're not allowed, but they, they do, but they're, by law, they're not allowed to use it after 10 weeks, whereas here you can use up to 24 weeks. That's generally not recommended, but um, as we know from some cases, there have been cases well into the third trimester where medical abortions have taken place because of the the telemedicine availability of these drugs. However, the one saving grace you might be able to say about, it, about medical abortions is that it does offer women a possible second chance. Uh, if once you, with a surgical abortions, once you put that instrument in, there's no going back. With medical abortion, because it's a two-stage process, uh, so the mother takes mifepristone, then she has to wait one or two days, generally before she takes the, the misoprostol. And there is now increasing evidence that if she changes her mind, despite having taken the first pill, uh, if she can get progesterone, I'll explain why in a second, uh, there is a, a more often than not chance that her baby might still be saved, as long as she hasn't taken misoprostol, and as long as there hasn't been major hemorrhage, because some women do bleed very, very quickly, very fast. So if there hasn't been major hemorrhage, major cramps, uh, she hasn't taken misoprostol and it's within 72 hours or so, there is a chance that mifepristone, mifepristone can be reversed. As I mentioned, mifepristone is a, re is a progesterone receptor antagonist, so it's designed specifically to bind to, receptor, uh, to progesterone receptors. It stops the natural progesterone from having its pr pregnancy preserving effect. And if you can get in there with extra progesterone, you can compete with those receptor sites for the mifepristone. Uh, I would emphasize, as it says on the slide, that this, this has nothing to do with the morning after pill or emergency contraception. This is purely for well-established pregnancies, pregnancy tests being positive, uh, and the mother has contacted some abortion provider and has been given these uh, lethal drugs. Progesterone, it's called progesterone because it means pro-gestation, pro-pregnancy, so it's to preserve, it's a naturally occurring hormone that's produced initially by the corpse luteum to maintain the pregnancy, and then later on in the pregnancy from 12, 13, 14 weeks, the placenta takes over the largely the production of them. And that's important when it comes to how much progesterone do we give to women who come seeking help. Steroid, all steroids uh, exert their effect largely through receptors, uh, which is, again is an important aspect when it comes to trying to deal with this problem. Mifepristone was initially designed for a different reason, as a, as a different type of steroid in the early 19, 1980s. Then it was discovered that you know, it, it, it binds to a progesterone receptor, and it was discovered then, that, or after research, that oh, maybe we can use this as to, to induce medical abortions rather than up until that, methotrexate would have been used and, and maybe some other uh, noxious agents to chemically induce uh, abortions. Um, using mifepristone alone um, is very successful in causing abortion, but it's not entirely successful. So they found that by introducing a second drug one or two days later, misoprostol, which is a prostaglandin and it causes uterine contraction, that that greatly enhances the likelihood of causing a, a complete abortion. So the current recommendations of the, that the woman takes, the mother takes mifepristone, 200 milligrams as a single tablet, followed one or two days later, usually by buccal or vaginal mesoprostol uh, for 800 micrograms. And the combination is guaranteed to kill the baby 98 to 99% of the time. It doesn't always cause complete abortion, mind you. Some of those women will still have uh, in, an incomplete abortion, and then some of them will end up having to go to hospital for a, a surgical evacuation, uh, about 6-7% um, of incomplete abortions, uh, with the, despite using the, the two drugs which in turn, if they don't have the, if they have an incomplete abortion, there's a risk of sepsis and, and death, as has happened in a number of cases, here and in, particularly in the United States. So the Catholic Medical Association was first approached in 2014 by Jack Scarisbrick, who founded LIFE, asking, could we look into this? Because women were coming to them regretting they had taken the first abortion pill. And he had heard at that stage that there was news coming from the United States that you know, it might be possible to, to do something about this. So we decided, yeah, we, we look into this. We were all skeptical. We didn't think this was going to be possible. And even if it was, how could we get uh, progesterone to these women if, in time? Um, we, then we had to address, first of all, is it safe? Because we were concerned, you know, could this be a thalidomide situation? The woman's already taken mifepristone. Even if the baby survives, will there be horrendous uh, 
congenital defects and we, we had to look into that and you know is it going to be successful we, it was very little information in 2014 because the, the US program had started really in 2012 even though the first cases anecdotal cases had been done a few years before that so there were, there were, there were some animal studies and particularly this one by Yamabe and colleagues in Japan who took a group of rats they, were, they weren't interested they're not, it's not a pro-life group they weren't interested in reversing the effect of progesterone they were looking at receptors and mo molecules but they noticed that when they gave progesterone with simultaneously with mifepristone that there was a 100% chance that the, that the pups the rat pups would survive whereas if they if the mothers given the mifepristone didn't get uh, the progesterone there was a 33% so that suggested that you know there was some at least a possibility that there was that progesterone supplementation might prevent or reduce the likelihood of, of, of abortions happening even if mifepristone has been uh, ingested. More importantly, I got a, there's a, the landmark study, the largest study today by a the wonderful doctor pioneer called uh, George Delgado in California, who is one of the main leaders in this field. Uh, did a, it's not a randomized controlled trial, but he looked at, he gathered all the information that he could from around the world of, of cases, and so it's, a, it's an observational study, uh, looking at success rates in, in women who had regretted their decision and had managed to get progesterone. Now, there was three different formulations were available, so some were oral progesterone, some intramuscular progesterone, which we can't really get in this country, and others via vaginal pessaries. And overall, Oh yeah, they had to compare it to the known information that if a, if a mother takes mifepristone, change of mind doesn't take misoprostols, because we know that with the combination there's a 99% chance abortion will happen or the baby will die. Uh, but it, what happens if she only takes the mifepristone and th th there was variations. But overall, and these studies, keep in mind, are only done to 15 days. So up to 15 days, there's a 75% a chance that the abortion will take place, so less than 25% chance of at least to 15 days after mifepristone. Um, so that's what, that's what we were comparing to. So if, if the mother manages to get progesterone, can we at least show some improvement over a 25% survival rate? And indeed they did. So in, the, in this observational study, uh, those who got the intramuscular uh, progesterone had a 64%, smaller numbers compared to the oral, which the majority of, of, of mothers received, and there was a 68% survival. So if you look at any of the American literature on this, they'll, they recommend that with abortion reversal, there's a 64 to 68% survival. We're not quite able to hit those targets, and I'll explain why. There's a lot of opposition to this, and that's uh, one of the reasons why we were banned for a short while for, for doing this. Uh, the, the initial op the opposition, and the real opposition, is there's, there's this caveat that oh, women don't change their mind. A woman decides she's going to have an abortion, she, she wants an abortion, and there's nothing anyone can do to... Uh, she's not being coerced, it's her decision. Um, the clue for this comes from, there was a, a, an interesting... Huffington Post uh, YouTube and uh, Huffington Post is not known for its pro-life values I don't think and um, there's a the, one of the most outspoken persons in the US uh, Daniel Grossman in California who uh, was very much opposed to abortion reversal he was asked specifically so what do you consider is it the treatment is it the progesterone is, is, is it dangerous he said no 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 it's not, it's not the treatment it's it's the rhetoric it's the rhetoric this this idea that women change their minds that, that we know that doesn't happen so that was his explanation However, when they realize, because well, you know, there's 5,000 or 4,500 women have, have had successful reversals in the United States, that means another three or 4,000 probably tried and it didn't work, so there are many thousands of women who are changing their minds in the United States. In this country, we've had several hundred who've changed their mind and it hasn't always worked out. So then they had to come up with something else. I said, well, it doesn't work. It, the women might change their mind, but it doesn't work. But then we were able to show with the Delgado study, with the animal studies, and with real life experience, well actually it is working. So now the latest one is saying, well it's dangerous, don't, don't touch it because women are going to get severe hemorrhage. Keep in mind that the hemorrhage comes from the mifepristone, not from progesterone. Progesterone does not cause hemorrhage, it's mifepristone. And if anything, um, progesterone alleviates or helps, if it's successful, will reduce the risk and prevent hemorrhage in many cases. So there's a lot of opposition. Um, we've had 55 babies born in this country. I, I don't know all of the outcomes. That's why I'm not going to present all of them. Um, I know Eileen has been involved in at least 12 of her babies have survived. And another doctor in another part of the country has had about 16 or 17. Um, so this is, this is my own sort of first 115 cases that came to me. And not all of them 
went ahead. So one of the accusations against us was that we were enforcing our beliefs on, on these vulnerable women. But the figures alone suggest that that's not the case because more than a third of them decided after the after discussing it with us by telephone that, no, no, I'm going to go ahead with the abortion or, sorry, I, I like what you're saying, but, you know, my boyfriend's put me under pressure or there's some, some reason why they decided not to go ahead with the, with the, the rescue treatment. Uh, so, of those who, who did start the treatment, uh, the, the, on, in, my, in my own sort of experience, 72, then some of them have been lost to follow-up. Uh, some of them have started and then stopped. Some of them, st very sadly, were doing fine, that had one or two scans and that got to more than 28 days. Everything's going, then they stopped uh, contacting me or answering. And I don't know, did they just want to put that episode behind them? Maybe they've had their babies, maybe they went ahead with the abortion, maybe they, maybe they miscarried late. Okay, so keep in mind that many, with or without uh, abortion, inducing drugs, women will have natural miscarriages, unfortunately, in, in early pregnancy. So some of the, what we consider to be failures, probably are actual natural miscarriages. So, so going by, again by my own, so 26 babies have been born, one more is due probably in about 15, 14, 15 weeks. Um, there's been a number, there's, there's a number of definite failures, there's been 19, that, that I know have definitely failed within the 15 day period. Some of them failed, but had gone even beyond 28 days. And it's difficult to know, were they, were they true failures? They may well have been, there's no way of knowing for certain. One ectopic pregnancy was picked up. That's important because we always insist that the, the mother gets a scan, that we start treatment often blindly. Some of them will have had scans beforehand, but some, a lot of them won't because they get the telephone medicine. Um, so we at least insist to get a scan. That scan was picked up because of uh, our role in, in helping her to, to get a scan, whereas the abortion providers weren't going to bother getting a scan. So it's difficult to know what our success rate is. I, I tell women it's 50% because that's the, the, the hard data, you know. These are the babies born, uh, these are the ones that we know didn't succeed and a few others then that, you know, had, had early miscarriages. So 50% I think is pretty suitable, is pretty uh, honest. However, if you, if you included those that, um, in the figures that were successful for more than 15 days or more than 28 days, you know, maybe our success rates are close to what the United States are having. I don't think so. I think it's probably 50, 55 percent. But that, that's, that's pretty remarkable when you think that the survival rate is less than 25 percent. So we're more than doubling the chance of survival by giving this simple, safe, natural treatment. The reason, by the way, that, we're, that I think that we're, we're less successful in the United States, first of all, there's less awareness. Uh, women are coming to us much later. In the United States, most places, in fact, in several states, it's mandatory that if a woman is undergoing a medical abortion, she has, to, she has to be informed that if you change your mind, there is abortion pill reversal and you can contact them on this number. Uh, that doesn't happen here. In fact, they're actively told now. We, we know this from the girls who come to us. They've been told, if you change your mind, do not go for abortion pill reversal. It doesn't work. It's dangerous. So they're actually being told that. So there's a, a misinformation campaign. This is probably the most important slide to, to, to care about. So you want to remember one thing, that if both abortion drugs are taken, there's a less than 2% survival, 1 or 2% survival. If she takes mifepristone, doesn't take misoprostol, but doesn't get help with progesterone, there's a less than 25% chance. It may be much less than that, but it's less than 25% chance that her baby will still survive. If she takes mifepristone, doesn't take misoprostol, and manages to promptly get um, progesterone, uh, there is a, at least a 50% chance, um, possibly more, that her, her baby will survive if she continues treatment. We continue treatment until we know the placenta is, is continuing to produce progesterone. Some of them are already uh, 12, 13, or even in the second trimester. In those cases, I, I give two weeks of treatment. Um, the, the other reason I think that we're less successful is we don't have the luxury of, of scanning women to know is their child viable. So women come to us and we blindly start them on treatment. Where in the, the US, a lot of them to go into their office and to get a scan done immediately and say, oh, sorry, it's too late, your baby's dead. So we, we don't know that probably or it's, there's a good possibility in many cases that the child may already have died, even, even though we're happy to give the treatment in the hope it might be, there might still be uh, life there. As I said at the start, there were a number of allegations brought against. We were report, Eileen and myself were reported to the General Medical Council in April, well, we were initially reported in January 2021, but uh, we were made aware of it in April 2021, and we were told we had to attend a tribunal. There was various charges brought against us, all of which were, uh, I suppose the one that's true there is that I didn't follow the nice guidelines on abortion provision. I wasn't providing abortion, so I, I admit I, I, didn't, I didn't do that, Your Honor. Um, we didn't force any beliefs on, on 
We, we knew from the start, I was defended by the Christian Legal Center, who were a wonderful organization affiliated to Christian Concern, and they knew we've got to get the women behind us, and that the women that we had helped, they'll be the ones who will decide the outcome of this, and they did. We got lots of uh, witness statements from women who'd had their babies, from women who were still pregnant and waiting their babies, from women who had tried the treatment and it didn't work, but they were so grateful that somebody tried to help them, and even from two women who decided not to go ahead with the treatment, but later regretted the decision that they wished they had done so. So we, we got, I got 10 statements, we could have got 40, um, and they were very powerful. We also got an expert witness who is an, an obstetrician who performs abortions. He's not a Catholic, he's not a Christian. And he looked at the, at the charges and he said, this is ridiculous. Uh, so he was happy to write a very strong defense uh, for us. So d despite that, this, uh, this, uh, I, I, uh, this was the charge that brought against me, that I must not prescribe, administer or recommend proge progesterone for abortion reversal, plus I wasn't allowed to do any voluntary work or any private work, which I don't do. Eileen was different because she's an obstetrician, so they couldn't stop her from prescribing progesterone, for example, but they had other, other plans for her, um, <laughs> evil, evil plans. Um, this went on and on. It was meant to go on for 18 months. In fact, they wanted to, they wanted to uh, cross us off the register, suspend us completely for 18 months. Uh, the, the tribunal thought that was a bit disproportionate, especially in the middle of COVID, when they were trying to bring doctors back from the dead to sort of look after them. So, so they said, well, you can do your normal NHS work, but you mustn't do, do this sort of thing. So uh, my, um, my legal team said that this is not, this is, this is daft. They were, they were astounded at the, they called it a kangaroo court. So decided we're going to sue them. So we sued the GMC and we took them to court. And we were surprisingly granted because we only put our application in the end of September 21 and I thought it would take at least a year because there was a backlog of COVID stuff. But we were granted a hearing on the 22nd or the, the, the 18th, yeah, no, no, the 22nd of February or 24th of February. Um, that, that's when the, we were due to attend the High Court. But um, a week beforehand, they, they, I got a phone call, or no, I, I got a phone call from my solicitor on CL, the Christian Legal Centre, and then a, a, an email a half an hour later from the GMC to say that the, the case had been dismissed, that they, the, the words they used, that there was no, no prospect of finding any evidence to support the allegations. It was interesting that uh, they, they left it to, until the, the threat of the High Court action, because they would have had to present evidence in the High Court. You can't go to... Uh, High Court and the judge says, uh, so, okay, would you like to present your evidence in this case? And you can't just say, well, we don't have any evidence, but we don't like what this guy's doing. You know, this, this. And that's really what it would have come down to. So they, they, there was no option. But that. Interesting, Eileen's case, because she went with a different uh, uh, legal team who told her, no, don't challenge this, just uh, accept what, what happens. And they didn't drop her charges until uh, six weeks later. Um, I think that's probably en enough to, to, to go on there.